So uh, we're going to start four steps for choosing the right load cell calibration system, explaining the difference in load cell types and indicators. So a little bit of logistics. Um, you know, we do this to educate everybody, but we're certainly hoping if you're not a customer that you become one. Uh, we're very passionate about making good measurements, uh, so I will be giving you every bit of information I can and telling you everything I can during this time. As I said, any questions, um, just type them in the chat bar or, or I'm happy to answer them or speak them, happy to, happy to answer them. Uh, there's a lot involved in selecting a cost-effective load cell system that will meet your measurement needs. Uh, we will pr be providing as much information as we can to allow you to make better decisions that works for your applications. Uh, a lot of people do this. I had a, had a discussion with a friend the other day. I said, I just don't get it. Some people will buy the most the less expensive system, I guess, because of counting or somebody else measurement system, and then they'll pay more money to get it calibrated than what the system costs. And that really doesn't always add up or that does not add up for me. Uh, and typically they are not going to be happy with the results. Uh, if you just spend those, a lot of times if you just spend a little more money on the system, a uh, little better load cell, put the right adapters on it, uh, you're going to get much better results through the lifespan of the so more information, um, this information uh, will help you regardless if you are, are or are not a customer. And, and then at the end of the webinar, we're going to have some uh, bonus offers uh, for, for sitting through my uh, grueling dribble, as I say. Uh, hopefully it's not grueling to anybody. I like to joke around. So my name is Henry Zumbron. I'm the president of Morehouse Instrument Company. Uh, there's my information if you want to write it down. Uh, this, available, this webinar is available in PDF uh, format after. If you want it, you can email me. Questions come up, ha happy to answer any of them. Just send them to that email. There I am. So what we do, um, we manufacture force calibration products. Uh, we calibrate force measuring equipment using standards with very low uncertainties, uh, as low as 0.0016% of applied force. That's also 16 parts per million. Uh, those two get interchanged a lot. These standards allow us to lower the uncertainties of equipment sent to us for calibration. We help labs make better measurements. And today we are hoping to help explain the difference in load cell types, indicators, adapters, and calibration providers. And we'll go over all of this throughout the webinar. So a couple questions for everybody here, some things to ponder. Um, are you confident that you have the right equipment for the measurement task at hand? Uh, is your indicator stable when force is applied? This, this one's a pretty big one. Um, if you're looking at an indicator, uh, most, most standards, uh, ASTM E74 and some other standards say the resolution of an indicator is not what's on that indicator. It's actually what that indicator is doing divided by two. So if I have an a million pound load cell with, an, with a one pound resolution, a lot of people are gonna say, hey, my resolution's one pound, but my actual resolution is how, how stable that, that di last digit is. So if it's varying by, if I, someone sent the, set the resolution to 10 pounds and it's actually varying, uh, or one pound and it's actually varying by 10 pounds, I have to take half that. So I'd have 10 divided by, by two, which would be five pounds. So uh, we have a system in for Cal now where the, uh, the actual resolution is varying by six pounds. They want it set to one pound. Uh, for our E74 calibration, we're gonna have to call it three. Uh, per E74, we're gonna have to take what, that, what the stability of that indicator is divided by two. So that, that's important uh, when, you're, when you're looking at some equipment. Uh, are you sending in your adapters so that they can be used during cali the calibration? We'll talk more about that during this. That's, that's very important here to, to make sure you're sending in the appropriate adapters uh, depending on what cells you have. And then is your calibration provider able to meet your accuracy or calibration requirement? How do you know they can meet them? Uh, just because they say they can? Uh, are they doing guard banding? Are they following, you know, ANSI Z540.3? If you've, if you've uh, attended our measurement risk webinar, you know more about that. We'll do a little bit of a recap on that uh, today. So, in general, we're going to have about 45 minutes in total. Uh, we're going to talk about types of load cells and their benefits and faults. Uh, and we're going to talk about choosing the right load cell system. Uh, and that kicks off the topic, which is four steps for choosing the right load cell system. Uh, number one, choose the right load cell for your needs. Uh, number two, choose the right indicator. You, you know, it is a system. Number three people miss is uh, choosing the right adapters. 
Um, so you, if you do one and two, but don't choose the right adapters or don't send those adapters in, uh, the results from the calibration lab can vary by quite a bit. Uh, we're doing a, a nice uh, summer project. I have my 18-year-old son here, and him and I are doing a nice uh, project on uh, difference of adapters and uh, variability in uh, load cell output, which would would respond, uh, which would, would, would be the error if we get one output and, and then use a different adapter. That would, there, there can be quite a bit of large error, which we're going to discuss some of the, some of those findings. Uh, eventually we're going to write a paper on that. And then, uh, step four, choose the right calibration provider. Um, so start, uh, load cells, uh, load cells have strain gauges. Uh, strain is, um, is the amount of deformation of a body due to applied force. More specifically, strain is defined as a fractional change in length. So that's what we're doing. You know, we're, we're going to put a gauge on material and we're going to we're going to apply uh, force to it and we're going to we're going to measure that. So what a strain gauge is, is it's a device whose electrical resistance varies in proportion to the amount of strain in the device. Uh, to measure small changes in resistance, strain gauges are almost always used in a bridge configuration with a voltage excitation source. So basically, they're going to wire usually four, sometimes more. Uh, here's our old million pound uh, reference standard load cell. We made it out of a, a, a special material, Viscount 44, and we use 16 strain gauges. So picture number two here, um, you're going to see uh, actual you know, strain gauges are mounted to the Viscount 44. Uh, there's 16 of them. And then we're going to solder them, and then we're going to wire them, and then we're going to put, uh, then we're going to remove the excess of uh, solder flux, um, add some ground wire, and then eventually you're going to prepare for testing. But when people say like uh, strain gauge configuration, uh, they talk about uh, bridge configurations, and here's here's a, a diagram. Um, most load cells or force transistors use a series of four resistive arms with an excitation voltage V. EX that is applied across the bridge. Some manufacturers uh, claim temperature compensation. They often do this by using dummy gauges to eliminate the temperature effects of the material. Uh, and they get this they, they get this so fine that you know the spec sheets are very very accurate in some cases. In some um, some cases, but if you're unsure if your cell's temperature compensated or not, you can always, you know, on a warm day, you can always take it outside for a little bit, bring it back in, and see what it, see what it does um, when you put it in your machine. Or cold, uh, either way. I do not recommend putting them in the refrigerator or the freezer. That can that can definitely damage the cell. But to put them in somewhere hot or somewhere cold, and and then bring them into the lab and put put force on, you can you can see rather quickly if if the device is temperature compensated or not. So, so as shown the pictures earlier, there's a better picture. Um, multiple strain gauges are used to measure the difference in voltage between the two signals. Um, a lot of people say the strain gauge is the heart of the load cell. I mean, that's really what's what's happening there. It's uh, we're, we're we're taking that strain measurement, we're applying a force, and that resistance is changing, and we're measuring that resistance. And uh, the load cell signal is converted to a visual or numeric value by a digital indicator. Um, we use an indicator to read that strain. Uh, when there's no load on the cell, the two signal lines are equal at equal voltage. That's your zero load reading. As load is applied to the cell, the voltage on the signal line increases very slightly, and the voltage on the other signal line decreases very slightly. The difference in voltage between the two signals is read by the indicator. That's all that our indicators are doing. Uh, this particular indicator is our high accuracy, um, our HADI indicator. Our high accuracy digital indicator, it's USB. You mount it with a load cell on a laptop. It can use coefficients and convert everything to engineering units, switch to newtons, kilonewtons, kilograms, LBF, working whatever. So that's how load cells work. Um, and then there's some load cell terms that you're going to see quite a bit. Um, and we're going to go over them briefly. Uh, creep. Basically, creep is the change in load cell signal occurring with time while under load and with all environmental conditions remaining constant. ASTM E74, if you choose method uh, A, uh, there's a creep test requirement. ISO 376 has a creep test in it. Uh, there are some, st uh, some standards with specific creep tests that say, hey, hold the force for this amount of time and, and record the output at uh, you know, 30 seconds, 5 minutes. So, and then uh, uh, the more common term uh, a lot of people talk about um, is nonlinearity. Uh, there's a curve, um, there's a straight line on this curve, you can see it. 
and then and then there's the then there's the cal data and nonlinearity is the al algebraic difference between the output at a specific load and the corresponding point on the straight line drawn between minimum load and maximum load so we're going to plot we're going to take the data plot a straight line and then we're going to basically see how much that differs and it's normally expressed in units of uh, percent of full squit full scale and it's commonly characterized measured around 40 60 percent at 40 to 60 percent that's typically what's going to be the worst case scenario um it's going to pull further away from the curve so then we look at uh hysteresis um hysteresis is the algebraic difference between the output at a given load descending from maximum load and the output at the same load ascending from minimum load so you see this here, your ascending curve, it goes up. And then typically most load cells, when you do a descending curve, you get to capacity, you know, capacities right here. And, and then you start to take measurements downward. The output's typically higher. Uh, and this curve shows, shows that. Um, and that's what they're doing. They're saying, you know, where is it? If you're using it to make descending measurements, it needs to be calibrated. As you can see, there's quite a bit of difference on the ascending curve versus the descending curve. We get into types of load cells, and that's where we're getting today. So hopefully you, you can hear these types of load cells. You make the decision, hey, that one's good for me because it's portable. I may have to sacrifice this, but I can get portability because I'm making, I'm doing, you know, I'm, I'm calibrating testing machines. Or you'd say, I want the absolute best cell because I want a reference standard. I want to calibrate my scales. I want to calibrate something else. I cannot afford to, you know, have these, have these cells not perform well. Um, and or I need something really tiny to fit in a location. There's only you know really one type of load cell to do that. So let's let's look at the types of load cells. Um, the first one's a column uh, load cell. Some people call these high stress load cells. I've heard people say dog bone load cells. Um, they all tend to have the same characteristic. Um, and some some things about them. Uh, the spring element is intended for axle loading and typically has a minimum of four strain gauges, two in the longitudinal direction and two are in transversely to sense uh, the Poisson uh, strain. So there's a little diagram here. You know, you have them. You can see the orientations a, a bit different. Uh, the cell I showed you earlier, the Viscount 44 cell, that was our old standard. That one had 16 gauges. Uh, typically, the more gauges, uh, the better the cell is going to perform in a rotation. It's going to minimize that error and split the differences. So, advantages of um, of these type of load cells: uh, physical size and weight. Uh, if you have, if you want a million pound load cell, it's really not uncommon to have a column load cell weigh less than 100 pounds. In fact, most are around 60 to 70 pounds. A million pound compression only column load cell. So, um, portability is one thing, especially if you're doing uh, big concrete testers or, or something else. It's it's portable. You can carry it. You can set it up in the machine and make your measurements. They do have disadvantages. Uh, I mean, it's a single, it's a piece of steel that has gauges on it. Uh, it doesn't have several columns. Um, and what that essentially does, it gives it a reputation for inherent nonlinearity. Uh, the deviation from linear behavior is commonly described to the change in the cross section area of the column. That's due to Poisson's ratio, which occurs with deformation under load. Um, basically, it's it's a it's a big long shaft and it is not going to deflect uh, equally. Sensitivity to off-center loading can be high and hardness of the loading pad can change output by as much as half percent. We're gonna talk about this and show an example later. And then larger creep characteristics than other load cells and often do not, uh, these often do not return to zero as well as other cells. Um, so, if you have one of these cells and you elect to use ASTM method A, which basically says ignore the ending zero, that typically is going to yield a larger lower limit factor. That used to be called the, the uh, uncertainty, but the lower limit factor is 2.4 times the standard deviation of, of multiple runs. Uh, we have an E74 webinar on that. But it's important to note that uh, these cells, uh, they don't come back to zero very well. It's, it's not uncommon to have a, to have a high zero uh, return on these. Then you get to uh, multi-column load cells, a uh, bit better uh, load cells. Uh, this, in this type of design, the load cell is carried by four or more small columns, each with its own complement of strain gauges. The corresponding gauges from all of the columns are connected in a series in the appropriate bridge arms. The benefit of these um, 
are you and I'll, I'll go over the advantages but they are typically going to cost more than the single column type of load cells because they're more difficult to manufacture and there's more work involved with manufacturing them and the advantages of multi-column cells are they can be more compact uh, than the high stress column cells uh, and they offer improved discrimination against the effects of off-axis load components they also uh, typically have less creep and have better zero returns than the single column cells. In many cases, a properly designed shear web spring element can offer greater output, better linearity, lower hysteresis, and faster response. Uh, these type of cells, Revere used to make a lot of them. Uh, they've been around for a while. Uh, they're, they're my choice of, uh, of a load cell if I had a high capacity cell. Um, and I wanted something that was both portable and good, and uh, not as susceptible to side loading and some of the other uh, some of the other um, air sources that single column load cells are susceptible to. Um, but the downside is they are a little they are more expensive. And then we have a very very small multi column cell pictured here on on the uh, right. This is our 600K mini cell. It weighs about 27 pounds. We designed it specifically for concrete testers and those that are out in the field that want portability. The one on the left is a bit better of a load cell. Uh, that one weighs 55 pounds. So if you're traveling you know, on an airplane, checking baggage, uh, portability here, um, you may want the 600K mini but it's going to sacrifice because it's about 0.02% of full scale compared with uh, the larger version where you can get uh, a cell that's, you know, better uh, than 0.01% of full scale. So you're going to sacrifice some of your accuracy um, for portability on, on that mini type of load cell, but still very good ASTM. Um, rated output, uh, usually they're at 0.25% and they want the cells to be 0.25% or better. So this cell is very good for ASTM. A 600K cell can go down to 50,000 pounds. Different type of load cell. These are bought very, very frequently. Uh, they're S-beam cells and they're inexpensive. Lots of them are coming in from China. Uh, there's lots of manufacturers of them. Uh, Futec makes many S-beam load cells that are actually very good. Uh, if you're looking to measure real small forces from, you know, five pounds to 50 pounds, um, I, I give a nice plug to Futec because that's their, they make a very good less uh, S-beam for those small force applications. Um, but in general, this uh, type of design is often used in weighing application. There are four gauges placed inside the beam. They're very symmetrical. Um, so, and they're very linear. So in general, linear, linearity will be enhanced by minimizing the ratio of deflection at rated load to the length of the sensing beam, thus minimizing the change in the shape of the element. Basically that's, they're very, very linear. And if you, if you load them with a, with a base um, through the threads in compression and tension, the output is very, very symmetric. Uh, and they are ideal, as I said earlier, uh, Futec making those, those really small, very good small uh, S-beams under 50 pounds. Uh, they are de ideal for measuring forces uh, under 50 pounds when physical weights cannot be used. Of course, if you can take hand weights to the application and use hand weights, that would be the preferred. That's going to be the most accurate method. If you cannot do that, the S-beam under 50 pounds is, is basically all you have. Uh, we do make a 100-pound shear web, uh, but it, that's that's a trade-off. Uh, disadvantages. These are, cells are very sensitive to off-axis loading. Uh, they're ideally suited for scales or tension applications. Compression output will be different if the cell is loaded through the threads versus flat against each base. So if we take this cell and we load it flat, we're going to get a different output than if we load it actually through the threads. Uh, and then we're going to show a picture. So when I say sensitivity uh, off axis sensitivity to side load this is it this is in our machine here on the left uh, we applied 10,000 pounds it's 10,000 pound of S-beam output 1 point negative 1.96732 millivolts per volt really aligned and then to the right here we we misaligned just slightly not not very much if you can see the difference in pictures and then just slightly misaligned uh, the output was negative 1.98211 the resulting if you do the math I did it up top here 
Uh, this is a difference. Uh, from that slight misalignment, that's a 0.752% error. So if you do not have very good technicians or you are not paying the absolute most you know, possible attention you can to align this cell, you are going to have um, some side load and it's going to, the errors are going to get high very, very quickly. So these are really not good standards for field standards. Uh, if people are using them to do testing machines and tension only, they're better. If they're, if they're trying to use them to make compression measurements, uh, there's no way a technician can go there and perfectly align this. It's just not a good sell for that application. And a lot of people buy them because they're, they're less expensive. Uh, you can buy SVMs for $250 to $400, depending who's making them. You can get them from China for 50 bucks if you buy an absolute boatload of them. So that's that's they're in use. Uh, they shouldn't be used for field application, uh, for certain field applications. Then we get to button load cells. It's interesting because the ones on the left uh, exhibit high errors from any misalignment. You can put these in a machine. A 0.1% misalignment can produce a large cosine error. Um, basically, you just put them in the machine, and even though they look center, even though you can use a scale to center them, you never get them perfect. Uh, we manufacture adapters for us to to actually calibrate them and get them as close to perfect as possible. But then when they leave our facility, those adapters normally don't go with them. So I don't know how good they're repeating in the field. Um, it's, it's a tough situation. And they're, they're good for small, very, very small uh, to fit in places where nothing else will fit. But they, they throw off a lot of heat. And they're just typically some, some errors can go from 1% to 10% on the cells on the, on the left. Uh, we have one customer that sends them in every six months, and they're about 10% error every time we do them. So it's they're really not a great uh, standard. But then uh, HBM made some cells um, right here on the right, really small, small, smaller cells, not as small as the button cells, but uh, small cells. And these are actually really good. Uh, they're also a lot more expensive. But if you need a very good cell for a small application, these HBM cells are good. Um, they can be as good as 0.05% uh, or better, uh, which is pretty phenomenal for uh, that type of small uh, load cell. So that's recommendation. Uh, again, choosing the right load cell for the application. If you have an application where you need, you know, 5 10% to measure within 5 to 10%, the ones on the left are okay. If you want to measure better than 0.05%, uh, you really need to buy those HBM cells that are on the right. Now we get to shear web load cells. These are ones you see everywhere. You see uh, lots of people manufacture them. Uh, they are very, very good load cells. Uh, I, these are the ones, these are my favorite cells uh, up to a point, um, up to about 100K, and then they get too heavy, and then I like the multi-columns. But the shear web load cells, uh, this type of load cell is typically the most accurate when installed on a tapered base with an integral threaded rod installed. Lots of people buy these cells without this integral adapter installed well guess what they're not as good without that the cell is can be a lot shorter for the height property but unless something is locked in here they just do not repeat as well uh, and they also have errors from uh, thread depth in them so they're fantastic if the base is installed and if the thread adapter is installed, I don't think there's a better cell on the market if both of those are installed. Once you start taking things out of them, you start derating them, and then they're no longer as good. But these cells typically have very low creep and are not as sensitive to off-axis loading as other cells discussed. These cells would be recommended choice for force applications from 100 through 100,000 pounds. After 100,000 pounds, the weight of the cell makes it difficult to use in the, as a field standard. Uh, we have a shear web uh, reference standard that weighs about 500 some pounds up to a million. So you're not going to carry around a 500 pound cell to make measurements. That's where the multi columns come in. But up to 100K, uh, 100,000 pounds, some people complain at 57 pounds. Uh, but up to 100, 100,000 pounds, I, I think they're very good all applications, field, uh, lab, wherever else. Um, and then at 200,000 pounds, it's a trade-off. I mean, that's always 140 pounds. If you have a 200K 
machine and it's going to stay in there mounted, you're only going to take it out once a year for calibration. I recommend it. If 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 not, if you're changing standards in and out, uh, your techs aren't going to be very happy with 140 pounds having to lift in and out, uh, even with cranes and everything else. It's uh, you probably want to go with a multi-column. So let's look at that. Let's look at a uh, SPN load cell versus a shear web. Uh, these are tests we, we've done in our lab. I have videos online. There are videos on YouTube. SPN cell, remember, 0.75% misalignment error. Uh, and then we deliberately misaligned the shear web cell over here to the right. And you can see, you can see this where I'm shading, coloring yellow here. Uh, you can see this is really misaligned, not like the S-beam. I mean, you can see that line of force is not pure. So we did that, uh, same test. Uh, we applied capacity to it. And the difference from misaligning a shear web was only 0.0022% versus the 0.75% for the S-beam. If we're looking at expanded uncertainty and what's going on in the field, um, so someone sends us an S-beam for calibration, the technician in the field misaligns it, applies 100 pounds what is it they think they're they think they're good to 025 or they think they're good to 10 pounds actually if they misalign that cell slightly they're close to 86 pounds 86.6 pounds uh would be their their actual true error of the measurement um whereas the s or the shear web type cell if the same tech goes out and misaligns that where they think they're good to you know 0.4 pounds um it's it's only going to change by about 0.1 uh, so very, very good for uh, field measurement, uh, less susceptible to those side loads. You can, if you have a tech that is not perfect with alignment, these, these cells are very, very forgiving. Um, regardless of what cell you're using, um, you know, multi-column, single column or anything else, uh, keeping the line of force pure, uh, free from eccentric forces is the key to calibration of any load cell. Uh, ASTM does not address the various adapter types, but ISO 376 does. And we want to use adapters that, it's gonna, that are going to help our load cell, not hurt it. Um, and when I say ISO 376 does, ISO 376 recognizes the importance of adapters and reproducibility conditions of the measurement. They have an annex. Annex A uh, talks about you know dual sphericals. And here's, here's the quote from Annex A 4.1. Loading fitting should be designed in such a way that the line of force application is not distorted. As a rule, tensile force transducers should be fitted with two ball nuts, two ball cups, and if necessary, with two intermediate rings, while compressive force transducers should be fitted with one or two compressive pads. So knowing that and knowing the, the importance of these adapters and knowing the importance here with the sphericals, um, I'm going to draw on here. We have tension adapters that we've made, and where the areas are highlighted are the sphericals. So there's two sphericals with rather steep radiuses. They, you know, almost look like a ball uh, when you when you see them. Um, and what that does is when you pull on it, that aligns everything. And and there's there's some better pictures, um, some some close-ups of what's going on. So on ours, uh, we have these tension members. There's typically there's two sphericals, one one here, and where I'm shading in um, at the top and bottom. And then, and then we use different adapters. We call these TMAs. So you can mount these, you can mount these TMAs here to any, any load cell uh, that you have. And then some of the TMAs mount to clevis types. If you're doing as a picture in the left, if you're doing uh, dynamometers, that's like a, a Dylan ED uh, junior uh, or, or ED extreme over there. If you're doing dynamometers, you can still have the spherical there and keep that line of force pure. So we offer these. Uh, there's a full kit that we have. It's a full uh, quick change value kit. Um, there's 20% saving on the cost when ordered as a full kit. Basically, we, we've taken our years and years of experience, put in the most common adapters that people are ordering. We've, we've put them in as a full kit. Um, and what they do, reduce tension change over time, uh, reduce cycle time, easier and faster setup for, or, uh, for technicians. They improve alignment by uh, using spherical radius contact as, as defined by ISO 376. Simplify setups by one tension member with several, you know, uh, 
as opposed to several adapters, uh, several different tension links. Um, and you can put clevises in them. They're rust resistance with black oxide coating. These really came about because of ice, because of two things, ISO 376 requirements. Uh, it's a very good standard. And, and because of a lean manufacturing course that uh, I took and uh, I realized pretty quickly that if we put these in our lab instead of all the various adapters that our uh, cycle time and turn time was gonna be a lot quicker. So. Uh, Twofold on why they came about, but uh, they do keep that line of force pure, and they will will enable you to make better tension memberments. So I alluded to earlier when we're talking about adapters, the different hardness of top adapters. Uh, the picture to the left is a multi-column cell with a red top adapter. If we supply a multi-column cell, or if you have a multi-column cell, this red adapter here we can make one to match the top of the cell. This is recommended. What, what it will do is match that cell and you can use it indefinitely. So as it deforms, as you use it through its life cycle and it deforms, it deforms to the top of your load cell. So every time that comes in for calibration, now you have a top block that comes in, that comes in with it that should yield repeatable results. Now, the cell on the left over here, um, this is single column load cell. And here's some of here's some of what my son and I are uh, looking at this uh, this summer. So this cell, um, we have different top blocks here, and you can see 4340 top block, hardened top block. And we're just doing a, a two different tests here with a hardened top block over here. That's the hardened one, and then and then this one, um, this other one here, the the larger uh, the larger one is the 4340. Uh, blocks, but if you can look at the look at the output there and look at the difference. So, um, if someone does not send their adapter in, uh, the situation on the right um, versus when they do send an adapter in with a hardened adapter, we're getting a difference in output of 0.263 percent on a single column cell. So this is uh, most people want their load cells to be better than 0.025. Um, you know, and right here it's 10 times more than that with just changing the top block. So um, we're going to go over that here. Um, and I've seen, we've seen in our testing, we've seen errors as high as 0.3%. We actually have one that's a little higher, and I have to go through the data a little bit more on that. But the importance of the adapters. So best practice, uh, I cannot stress this enough for anybody, um, is to send any top blocks or plates with a load cell that's being calibrated uh, to wh whomever's doing the calibration. Uh, each load cell should have top blocks and they should be ground flat. Uh, one of the other tests we did that, that's not shown there is we started rotating these top adapters because they're not they weren't marked where the where the front zero position was. So we started rotating them, and we did see shifts in data um, just the way we position them on the cell. So uh, that changes is if they're ground flat. Uh, that's very good practice, and and you'll get a better calibration. Uh, if you have top blocks that are ground flat, we do an E74 cal. I guarantee you that the cow is going to be better than if they're if they're boogered up or uh, have have divots and some other things. So, and then using tension adapters with a steep spherical radius will provide better vertical line of force, producing better results. Um, so then we we did load cells, uh, importance of adapters. We're going to cover a little bit on indicators. Um, so in here, these are the three indicators we offer. There are many other indicators out there on the market. Um, we have the 4215, the Hattie, uh, we have a DSC, and then we have this portable battery unit. Um, and if we look at them, it's it's whatever whatever you want. Uh, there have, uh, does the indicator have to be better than you know 0 0.005%? Um, again, these are for our indicators. Are you willing to use a computer to convert millivolts to volt to engineering units? Uh, do you require portability without a power adapter? Uh, do you have more than two load cells? If those are the case, uh, I'd recommend something like a Hattie or a digital USB. Uh, there's several people that are making you know USB indicators. Um, the, the Hattie just happens to be one of my favorites, and that's why we resell it. Uh, we resell our indicators. We do not physically produce them here in-house. Uh, most people are doing the same thing. Most, hey, if you go to load cell companies or whatever, uh, very rarely are they making their own indicators. Um, then there's the PSD. So do you want something portable? Um, 
uh, without a power adapter? Do you only have one load cell or do you have, you know, uh, one load cell that's compression tension or do you have two load cells that are compression only? Uh, are you okay with close to direct reading? Now, close to direct reading is not as good as direct reading. Uh, you will have additional error, error you need to compensate for. That's usually when someone gets into an accuracy statement that says, hey, I want 0.1% of full scale and then you get into doing risk and guard bands and lots of other things. Uh, do you want portability with batteries? Um, do you want something that's just real easy, take it out of the box, put it in, grab a measurement, uh, then these handheld meters, and lots of people make them, uh, then that's something uh, you may want. Um, and then we have the last one, uh, do you want an indicator, um, does the indicator have to be better than 005% uh, yes or no? Uh, uh, do you have more than two load cells? Do you want to span multiple calibration points? In that case, uh, 4215 is good. If you want something set up close to direct reading, we can span multiple um, multiple calibration points. There's other indicators out there. AdMed has one that you can span 10, G, GSC. There's just lots of indicators out there. Rice Lake, uh, lots of good indicators out there uh, that you can do multiple span points. The problem with doing this though, is you have it calibrated one year and this year we, we set it up, it reads 10,000 pounds. Next year it comes back to us, it could read 10,005 and you could say, hey, I want you know 0.1% accuracy spec and it's still in, but it's drifted out. And you, if you're not correcting your error, your actual error can, can get much larger. Whereas with the Hattie or if you're using the coefficients, each time you send it back in, you get a new set of coefficients for calibration. You program them into the software and then you're always direct reading. So uh, some things to consider. Choose an indicator based on your accuracy and uncertainty requirements. Choose based on environmental conditions. Some indicators are only four wire. A lot of those span indicators are only four wire, which means changing cable lengths will require recalibration. It also means that if you're outside in harsh temperatures, um, that you're going to have additional error because the resistance is going to change. So choose based on price. Um, if I showed you our three indicators, but if price weren't an option, I'd go buy H. I'd go. I'd recommend anybody buy the HBM DMP 40s. Uh, they're twenty thousand dollar indicators, but they're they are fantastic. We've married them with our reference standards. Um, but again, that's do you need that? Uh, they, they, those indicators are good to 002 percent or better. Um, so. There's some. There's a lot of a lot of things to consider there. Choose based on ease of use. Um, if it's going to be difficult, some indicators we have customers that send in where they have to enter like five span points, and they have to fit, the tech has to physically type them in every time they change a load cell, and they think that's okay. Um, but that's a lot. There's a lot of the, the tech could enter a number wrong, and they're not going to know if they're they're measuring it right or not. So. Um, Ease of use is definitely a consideration uh, when you when you look at these, and you know some are just a simple two span uh, that might be good enough. Uh, choose based on ruggedness. You know, if you're in harsh environments, you probably aren't going to want to take a, a R4215 around. Uh, the Hattie's going to be better, or, uh, or or depending on what you want, if you want a direct reading, maybe uh, the Admet or maybe the Race Lakes better. Uh, I don't know. Uh, choose based on the number of load cells and channels required. Uh, yeah, some some of these indicators you might need five of them. Um, you know, if they're just a uh, one point, not not even unipolar indicator, you might need numerous. At, at which point, if you're going to buy five indicators for for different cells, you may want to consider you know something else that's going to make things a lot easier. So, lots of different things to consider on the uh, on the indicator side. So those who have been in other webinars know the answer to this. I have a 10,000 pound device with an accuracy of half percent of full scale, plus or minus five pounds. My calibration certificate says my unit reads 10,004 when 10,000 pound was applied. Is my device intolerant? So here I have, I have an error of two pounds, an error in four pounds. If people are saying, yes, it's with intolerance, well, it's maybe. We don't know until we know how good the reference standard is. So, um, if the measurement uncertainty is not being reported properly by your service provider, there's no way to know if the device is in tolerance and you do not have a traceable measurement. So there's, this is a graph. So you didn't know if it was or wasn't, and then we show you the graph and you say, yeah, there's no way that's intolerance. I have a 30, 34.47% risk um, on that. And that's, that's the area to the 
that's using you know the TUR formula, and this is using method five for ANSI Z540.3, which we'll eventually have a webinar on that. Uh, do you know if your calibration provider is passing instruments that should not be passed? Well, if they're not taking in the measurement uncertainty of the standard into this determination, then they're not complying with the standard. They're not complying with uh, 17025. And you may be getting a measurement like this where they're reporting 10,004 pounds. You think it's in, but in actuality, there's a 34.47% that it's not, uh, which leads us to step four, which is choosing the right calibration provider. So everybody talks about TUR. Uh, TUR is test uncertainty ratios. It's the tolerance divided by the expanded uncertainty. There to the, to the right, here we get the formula, uh, the CMC. CMC is how good the reference lab is. Uh, typically, that's divided by two. Uh, they should use the appropriate K value. Ours is 1.96, but I use two for simplistic sake on this uh, on this demonstration. Uh, uh, plus the resolution, plus the repeatability of the UUT. So if we look at we look at two scenarios, 10,000 pound device accurate to 0.5% of full scale with a 0.01 pound resolution and 0.05 pound repeatability. We look at RCMC of 0.02%, one-sided tolerance of five pounds, uh, expanded uncertainty 0.22. The TUR, when we do this, we're 22 to one. We're 22 times better than what we're calibrating. If we look at one of our competitors with 0.5%, um, basically, this raises it's very, very high. Uh, once everything else, uh, one-sided tolerance is the same, but the expanded uncertainty here is five pounds. So th there, you'd have a TUR of one to one. And to further show you what that means, um, if you look at this, this 10,004, if we calibrate it, it's intolerance. With a, when a lab that has a CMC of 05 calibrates, the risk goes from zero to 34.47%. So that this TUR, uh, the the uncertainty of that reference standard is very important on whether you can pass, whether an instrument will pass or fail calibration. And more on the right calibration provider. Here's an e E74 cert. This is not ours. Uh, this is this is just a violation. Uh, this one. Certain calibration providers will not follow standards. Then this one, they're claiming zero. Uh, they came zero can be used as a first calibrated test point. It's not true. There are sections of E74 such as 8.6. The loading range shall not include forces outside the range of forces applied during the calibration. And then section 7.2.1. In no case should the smallest force applied be below the lower limit of the instrument as defined by 400 times the resolution for class A or 2,000 times the resolution for class AA. In this example, the resolution is 01. So the first test point that they could really uh, apply would be 40 pounds, and they do not have it here. Um, their lower limit should be 500. If you have a certificate like this, I urge you to look at this and see if you are in violation of the standard, uh, because this certain this cal provider does this frequently. That is violation. Uh, they're saying the class A lower limit is 192.3. In actuality, per E74, the best it can be is 500, because that's the first test point. And then we can go on and on about calibration providers and, and other things. Um, some calibrations providers do not include information to provide a traceable measurement. Uh, here's a cert. We don't have anything on, no mention of measurement uncertainty uh, of the reference standard anywhere. Uh, they claim direct traceability to NIST and not to SI units. That's not good. Does not report uncertainty for points, so that's not in compliance with uh, ILAC P14. Uh, meets, they make a note that say they meet all published specification, uh, but but then they do not list any of them. It's, I guess it's just general that they meet everything. You're great. And then, you know, they, it's what are they doing with this exercise run? Typically, it's two to three times to, you need to exercise the device two to three times to make it stable. So, uh, uh, that's us. Uh, we take great pride in uh, in our um, customers, uh, and when we get scorecards, uh, our aim is always to be 100% uh, uh, on time and satisfaction. I know we won't meet it all the time because some people are going to be mad regardless, but we want to meet it at least at that K equals three. That 99% of the time, we want to we want to be there and we want to have a good scorecard. So. 
the right calibration provider has, and this is these are some some examples. You you can choose your own here, but uh, the right calibration provider has a measurement process and certainly capable of meeting your standards and follows published standards. That's a recommendation. Replicates how the instrument is being used. Has that contract review. Has that discussion with you. How are you using it? Uses the right adapters to ensure results are repeatable. Has competent technicians with training records. Uh, they don't just throw anybody in there. Uh, follows published standards. Uh, that's a big one. If there's a standard that you're calibrating to, uh, the hope is that they're going to follow it. Uh, otherwise, why are you having them calibrate to that standard? Uh, reports measurement and certainty correctly. Is rated highly and reliable for on-time delivery. Uh, there's a lot that say, oh, yeah, we'll get it done in a week, and then it sits for three weeks. Um, so conclusion, uh, a semi-conclusion, because I have, I have a number five that, that's next, but uh, choose the right load cell for your application. An S-beam load cell is not going to perform as well as a standard for doing ASTM E4 calibrations in compression. Um, choosing uh, a readout that is stable with enough resolution uh, is going to yield the best results. Yes, if you... If you're doing E74 and you have a resolution of two pounds, that 400 times the two pounds, 800 pounds is the is the first point is um, that that the calibration provider is going to have to use based on that standard. Um, and then most importantly, number none of this matters if your calibration um, provider cannot calibrate to the accuracy required if they do or if they do not follow. Uh, follow the published standards. So if you have a device that's 0.1%, you need a device calibrated that's 0.1% and you're sending it to a calibration provider that uh, can only do 0.2% uh, right off the bat. If you have a 0.1% device and you're sending it to a cal provider that can only do 0.1%, maybe they can't meet your needs. Uh, they may have to pay to that, pay more attention to that location of the measurement. It may not work out. That may be, it may be a case where that's the best you can get. I know uh, Fluke and some of the other ones, uh, when you're dealing on the electrical side, sometimes you have a one-to-one. -one. Uh, but with force, you typically don't need to have a one-to-one. -one. And then number five, which I should have added, um, but I, I, I snuck it in in the back, is is trans, transportation. Uh, if the instrument is damaged during shipment, problems such as uh, lost calibration history, unrepairable scenarios, extra cost to repair, and claims may not be paid. We've had oops uh, actually lose instruments, um, and you can't do you can't do much about. Uh, things when they lose an instrument, but you can protect your instrumentation, and that's this recommendation. Here's a custom foam fit case. Uh, load cell goes in here, meter goes in here, computer goes in here. That lid shuts down. Um, the only way that's going to get damaged is if it's if they open it and it falls out, which should not happen. If it gets stuck on a conveyor belt, your case might get sanded a little bit. We've seen that happen, but the instruments always arrive um, intact. Um, and then there's good double boxing. Uh, if you have a shipping department and can control this, recommended double boxing. Um, now I know some people that are on our list today that, uh, and this is this is this is this is good for those that are on the list. They have these custom blown foam um, systems. They are great. They are very very good, but they're bad when you have a very heavy load cell with an integral tape cable attached to it, and that's why this picture is bad because this. As, as it jostles around, it's going to start deforming this custom blown foam because it doesn't have the, uh, the strength or the thickness to really absorb the shaking in there. And lots of times we're going to get this cell in and that cable is going to be damaged, uh, pinched, or even severed just from the rumbling around in the case. So it's something to pay attention to. Uh, maybe not if the cable's not integral and can be separated uh, and put the cable on the top, you're better off. If it's an integral cable, you really should go with the uh, uh, custom cases. And then the ugly, here's the ugly uh, banded. This actually left in a wooden box and UPS repacked it because they, they, it fell off one of their trucks. So uh, not much more to say about that, but this is, you know, just throwing something there. And when UPS repacks something, they usually uh, just wrap it with cellophane and it shows up on your doorstep. It's not the best scenario for your test equipment. So I want to thank everybody. Uh, we do have special offers. Uh, our marketing department has sent some things around. You may have seen them. Uh, the special offer till the end of August is 20% off any Hattie indicator kit. Um, that's... Uh, 
that's an ongoing till the end of August. If you're thinking about you want a different indicator, you want one with a computer, uh, you're doing e, E74, E4 work or anything else, um, th th this might it might be a good time to change your system. And due to the increase in shipping incidents uh, and oops and, and the other people dropping cases, um, anybody um, that sends their system in for calibration can receive 25% off a custom foam storm case. Uh, we use the Pelican storm cases, like them better, a little bit better latches than just the regular uh, Pelican case. And the typical list is 295 to 595. Uh, case pictured on the right is actually one that's 495. Uh, we pay about $200 for the case, uh, $50 for the foam, and then we have and then we have about an hour to two hours of labor in in each of these. So um, we're basically we. If anybody's thinking about a case, uh, we want them to upgrade. Um, so those are our, those are our two existing offers. Uh, we have some upcoming training. Um, we are at booth 313 at NCSLI conference in National Harbor, Washington, D.C. That's August 13th through 17th. It's a rather good trade show. Uh, with two tutorials we're giving one will be on force and one on torque and then october 2nd through 5th we have a four-day training at morehouse two full days with hands-on force training spc and advanced topics that if if anybody wants um this webinar please please request a pdf copy or you can go to our website mhforce.com training for that um, and then I want to tell everybody about our force measurement insider if you're not a member suggest signing up it's free uh what the things that we do as part of the force measurement uh, insider is free reviews of calibration certificates from other force calibration suppliers. If you're questioning if your ASTM Cal is compliant, if you have the right measurement and certainty, if they've reported it correctly, uh, you can send it to us. Uh, we have an offer. We will perform a calibration, send you the data, and you only pay if we meet your needs. That's if you're considering if you have a scale that you want to send in and, and you need guard banding and some other stuff. We want to work with you, get what you need. Uh, we have exclusive Excel templates. Uh, we're currently giving one out on a PFA calculator, uh, calculate risk and comply with ANSI Z540.3 method five. So when I said that stuff about accuracy, if you want that, request it from us. Uh, you can have that Excel sheet. You can plug in your numbers and see how good your calc provider needs to be uh, to meet your needs. Uh, access to upcoming information uh, and training webinar, free merchandise, promotion, articles on force torque related co topics that's, that aren't on the web, uh, exclusive offers on force calibrating equipment and training, you'll get on that list, you get those, and time-saving tips using lean manufacturing techniques for the Cal Lab. Uh, I've been through lean, a lean champion, and I will write those occasionally. And some of those tips, like point of use to save time, uh, you won't believe, you know, 20, 20, 40 bucks, uh, you put 20, 40 bucks in the lab, locate locate tools where they should be located, and then technicians aren't hunting uh, hunting things, and all of a sudden you're getting two or three more cows done a week, and uh, just from, you know, uh, uh, investment at like $40 uh, to buy magnets and, and keep your tools uh, like right near the machine. Um, one step away from getting all those, you can sign up um, at the Force Measurement Insider. But uh, that's it. Um, so I would like to thank everybody who stuck around uh, for anything, and I would like to answer any questions if anybody has them. So please type questions in the chat bar or ask them.